Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm Risa Gallia, Dean of the University of Virginia School of Law, and it is my pleasure, along with Tom Miles, Dean of the University of Chicago Law School, to welcome you to this wonderful webinar. As you know, in the aftermath of last spring and last summer's historic protests, individuals and institutions across the nation have been wrestling with our history of racial inequity and looking for paths forward for a more just and equitable future. The corporate world has taken a close look at itself. Some companies and firms have been reviewing their diversity and inclusion practices, creating positions for diversity officer managers and issuing public statements on race and supportive groups like Black Lives Matter. Similarly, schools and institutions of higher education like ours have sought ways and continue to seek ways to address these issues, not only at the institutional level by looking at whom we hire and admit and creating environments in which everyone is able to thrive and belong, but also and importantly in our scholarship and in the classroom. From the cases we use to the voices and experts we amplify, our faculty play a, crit a critical role in both making the classroom a more inclusive space and creating better understanding of the role of race across so many areas of the law. So that's why I am really excited today uh, about this panel, Insights on Teaching Race in Business Law. And I'm so excited that Kathy Huang, Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, who is part of the John W. Glenn Jr. Law and Business Program, and Tony Casey, Deputy Dean, and Donald M. Ephraim, Professor of Law and Economics and Faculty Director of the Center on Law and Finance at the University of Chicago Law School, have joined forces to bring this panel to you. This group of scholars from across the country, who Kathy will introduce in a minute, will share insights and strategies on dis teaching, discussing and teaching issues relating to race in the business law curriculum. Uh, I did some research about this panel, and I believe that it is the first of its kind. Um, there have been panels substantively on issues of race in business law, and there's been writing on teaching about race in business law, but it's my understanding uh, that this is the first convening of such a panel. I could be corrected, um, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but I see this as an indication of this new energy and attention to racial equity in law schools, and especially to how it is addressed in the curriculum. Racial issues are shot through our law as they're shot through our national history. And I'm really glad to see our faculty uh, and faculty across the nation thinking about how to educate our students about them in classes of all kinds. So let me just say thank you before I sign off uh, to our panelists, Afra Afsharapur, Carlos Chapman, Kathy Huang, and Elizabeth Reese. Thank you to Tony and Kathy for bringing us together virtually today to discuss these important issues. To Libby Seguin, manager of the Center on Law and Finance at the University of Chicago, who has taken the laboring oar in organizing us today, and the events and communications teams at both Chicago and UVA for planning this event. Kathy, I turn it over to you to say more about our distinguished panelists, and I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much. Um, thanks also to the Dean for coming to kick us off, which is lovely. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our fabulous panelists today. So first we have um, Afra Afshari Poor. She's the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at UC Davis. She teaches and writes about business law, including corporate governance, M&A, and the role of women in M&A. And many of us will also know her as a wonderful mentor, especially to women and people of color in the academy. Um, Carlos Chapman is a professor at Washington and Lee. She teaches and writes in corporate and commercial law. She's also the author of two new books, a forthcoming BA casebook with Carla Reyes and a children's book called Corporations Are People Too. Earlier, um, I guess not this year, last year, Carlos um, and Ben Edwards and I worked together on something we call the Business Law Professor's Statement on the Role of Race in Business Law, which you can find um, on the Business Law Profs blog. And finally, Liz Reese, who is a Bigelow Fellow at the University of Chicago. She writes about American Indian tribal law, race in the law, voting rights. And we're very excited to welcome her perspective to the, uh, our discussion as well. And me, I am a professor at the University of Virginia and I write about business law and contracts. So we have two goals for today's discussion. First, we wanna think about specific ways to teach race and intersectionality in business law courses. We know that sometimes it's really daunting to think about how to incorporate race or critical perspectives into what has been a, a course that has traditionally not incorporated that much. So we hope you can kind of take away at least a few concrete things that you can use in your classes this semester. We also wanna think collectively about how to cultivate a pipeline for more diverse business law professors in the future. So we hope that it's a discussion 
session and people feel free to just jump in um, and not wait until the end. If you have a question or a point, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Tony Casey has uh, kindly volunteered to moderate questions and he will be gathering them and sending them to the group. So with that, let me turn it over to Afra who has the first question for us. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks so much to Kathy and Tony and both UVA and uh, Chicago for really organizing this event. And what an honor to be here with all of you, especially scholars I admire so much. So my question for both you, Carlos, um, and also for Liz is, is there a way, what, is there a way that you teach um, racism and anti-racism in a specific business law unit or as you're discussing a specific business law case in order to incorporate race and anti-racism in your classroom? And to what extent do you focus on race and anti-racism and do you also focus on other intersectional issues such as race and gender or race and disability? So maybe okay. Carlos will go with you first. Okay, so, you know, I think the first thing I think we have to do is, is to challenge how we frame this discussion. Um, if we're choosing to teach business law and we are choosing to disregard businesses impact on marginalized people, we are teaching race and business law. We're just teaching whiteness and business law, right? We're, we're teaching the principles that govern only white people and even maybe a select group of white people instead of presenting a full picture of business law. So, you know, since we don't call our current classes white contracts or white BA, we have to be careful when we start labeling classes race and contracts, race and property, race and, and acknowledge that those other classes are lacking something fundamental if the content isn't already there, right? We're always teaching race whether we want to or not. So because race is fundamental and it's an undercurrent in all law, I teach race throughout all of my courses. I teach marginalization throughout all of my courses. It doesn't require a detour or a pause. It simply takes acknowledgement of the full story and teaching what's already there that we have been indoctrinated to disregard. Um, so I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, when I teach first year contracts, I open the semester with a discussion of in Ray Baby M. And you know, I like that case because it invokes this outrage, right? It's this idea that these people are trying to buy a baby. And so I start that discussion with folding in the 13th Amendment and the idea that it was our public policy for centuries to buy and sell some babies because we chose to define those people as non-persons. So I reframed the question as why can't you buy a baby anymore? And why could we buy some babies before? And, and what does that do to contracts to erase the humanity of a certain class of people? Um, when I teach upper level classes, I revisit these issues by challenging our fundamental systems of beliefs and thinking about how we define terms and the bias that is inherent in a lot of the definitions of our business law concepts. You know, the one that always comes to mind is the reasonable person. Um, in the business law context, you've got the rational investor, the sophisticated investor, even things like agent and principal and who has capacity to contract. When we think of these concepts, I like to highlight for our students that their mind's eye is going to see a certain person when I say reasonable person, and that person is probably not a person of color. And why is that, right? And when we discuss people who need the protection of the law, what kind of person do you see? And, 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 and let's challenge that bias with these defined terms. So if you just approach business law in general through the lens of thinking about who's included, who's excluded, how did we develop these norms, and why we avoid certain conversations in bi business law, it makes the avoidance of race and marginalization a form of malpractice instead of something that's extra. Liz or Kathy, do you wanna add? Uh, sure, I'd love to jump in. So I um, uh, come to some of this from the background of uh, federal Indian law and uh, tribal law. And uh, one of the things that I encourage people all across the country to do a lot is to just include uh, tribal law more in your courses generally. Um, because uh, 
you know, if you think about it, most of the law that we teach is predominantly state law um, or state law opinions, but uh, states aren't the only sort of sub-sovereign governments that are a part of the United States. Uh, there are tribal governments as well, and they're, they have courts that are issuing opinions, they have laws, they have statutes, all of these uh, different things that we could be including in uh, the teaching that we're doing and the stories that we're telling about the law in the United States. And yet we don't do that. And instead what we do is effectively ignore and then sort of erase the existence of the native people and the native governments um, in this country in the way that we're thinking about the law and, and the legal systems and the place of um, indigenous law and legal systems within the United States. And so not only is that sort of a problem, um, but um, it's also oftentimes um, a missed opportunity because uh, one thing I wanna point out is that there's some sort of exciting and interesting things happening uh, with uh, native nations and uh, indigenous people and corporate law as well. Um, and so, you know, some ideas to sort of think about, uh, things to put into maybe some of your teaching units that, you know, very much intersect with questions of race, but are also an opportunity to just do some good teaching, get some, get some students thinking. Uh, so many tribes, uh, for example, have limits on the taxation that they can do of their own territories. And so actually have to have a separate corporate arm um, that sort of operates in adjacent to the government arm. Uh, and sort of that corporate arm has to, of course, then operate very differently and sort of share powers in an interesting way uh, with the government that the tribe has. Um, and those corporations are fascinating. <laughs> the rules governing them are fascinating. Uh, the limits to their authority, the pros and cons of how the powers get share, uh, shared between the two. Also the law under which they incorporate, whether it's tribal law, whether it's gonna be state law, how they're gonna structure themselves, what you know, how they're gonna limit themselves, et cetera, is really interesting. Um, moreover, uh, Alaska is, you know, mind boggling. I could talk about Alaska forever, but, um, you know, just a, a bit on it, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act effectively means that though there are a bunch of Native American tribes in Alaska, their land is actually owned by um, corporations that all of the native people who are also um, tribal citizens are also shareholders in these corporations that then manage all of the land and resource rights. So there's this sort of very complicated um, dual system playing out between all of the complexities of managing uh, shareholder rights and politics and uh, that identity and the pros and cons with that on the other hand, the citizenship one. Um, and so it's, I think, a really interesting opportunity to also just get students thinking through corporate governance and what that means versus, you know, citizenship governance governance and what that means, um, you know, on the ground, because that's something that is playing out actually with uh, tribes in Alaska right now. Um, so, you know, readings like that, I think, are natural places uh, to get students thinking about, you know, just some of these basic fundamental fascinating questions. Um, and also, you know, race and justice and the history of native disenfranchisement of land and the government involvement in this, et cetera. So, um, you know, with that, I've, you know, suggested, of course, some basic ways that they could get, uh, or that you all could introduce uh, tribal court opinions maybe into some of your teaching. Um, but, you know, Alaska <laughs> might be a little bit more uh, complex things. I, I wanted to sort of then kick it off to some of the other panelists to ask maybe about some of the challenges of teaching uh, about race when it comes to some of these more either complex topics or maybe more advanced courses and how to uh, sort of present that in a way that feels natural or engaging for students. Kathy, maybe you want to talk about that because you teach mergers and acquisitions in advanced business law course. And yeah. uh, you may want to. 
Yeah. So um, I think I, so there's kind of like three things, right, that I do. So first, I guess I, sh I put out a plug for um, over the summer, Jer uh, Jessica Erickson put together a really great resource with just things that you could incorporate into the business law uh, curriculum, which I think is really helpful. I believe it's a Google Doc. Um, so it's easily accessible. So that, I think that's a great place for ideas. Um, In-house at UVA, um, our one of our committees also has been putting together um, resources just for different types of courses. So not just business law, but you know, like torts and tax and all of these other areas where we can incorporate these discussions into class. For me personally, I think there's kind of two things that I try to do. So the first is I try to incorporate these conversations into the course incrementally. I don't do like a race and business law day the same way that I don't do an agency and business law day or a least cost avoider and business law day. I think all of it has, there's a thread that runs through the whole um, course. And, and I think these kind of intersectional and, and critical issues are part of the course and should be part of it. So literally what I do is every week um, when I look at the cases I'm going to teach, I try to think like, is there a way to expand beyond like what's in the teacher's manual or what we traditionally think about as part of this course? So for instance, I just taught a course in M&A called Vantage Point, which is, um, it's in Therese Maynard's book and it's about, um, it's about voting by share class. Um, and it also hinges on California's corporate long arm statute. So it's an internal affairs uh, question. So I took the um, I took the opportunity not just to talk about California's long arm statute, but also to talk about the ways that California tries to influence corporations that are that are based in California, right? So for instance, with its two recent board diversity laws um, and kind of giving students like an update on what that looks like. And I think that's essential. Like they should know that this is happening as they go into practice. In duty of care, I talk about, you know, the studies about groupthink and how diversifying a corporate board helps bring more ideas to the table and helps um, boards discharge their duty of care more easily. So I try to do kind of those concrete things um, on a day to day, like almost like class by class basis and not every single class am I able to incorporate something or even every week, but I just try to audit my notes every week and make sure I do that. I also audit my notes to make sure they're funny enough. So I do a lot of that uh, note auditing. Um, and the second thing I do is I try to make sure that our diverse student body sees a diverse group of people that they can relate to. And this is an, actually an incredibly small amount of work. It just requires like a small amount of tweaking on the edges. So for instance, I try to make sure we have um, a large number of women and people of color and LGBTQ people um, kind of put in front of our students as if I have a guest speaker, right? Um, this is super easy. If you need ideas for people to invite, I'm very happy to introduce you to folks. And I think our pan other panelists probably have lots of people that they can introduce you to as well. Um, the other thing that I think is really valuable that students have told me really like is like they really value is putting names into like the exam or your discussion questions or your like your you know hypos that are not just you know Bob and Jane. So a friend of mine says that the way she does this is she thinks about all of her friends from childhood onward and she basically just like makes a list. Um, and you know some of them are named Stephanie and some of them are named Afra. So you just put them in um, into the you know and kind of add them to the rotation of your hypos. Um, and I think that that kind of helps that helps students see themselves in the classroom. But I wonder, like outside of these individual class situations, so this question, I just want to know from Afra, as associate dean, how do you think about this more on an institutional level? Like, how do you kind of support all of your faculty in their endeavors to add more of this? So let me start out with saying that, I mean, I think this is really institutionally for all of our institutions, this is still very much a work in progress. So I actually in Pre preparing for teaching this semester, I went back and I both looked at Jessica's uh, compilation of materials that she had put together and then went back and read Cheryl Wade's work from you know, 15 years ago where she's talking about these issues. And part of what made me kind of frustrated institutionally is why are we still talking about this and not doing it um, you know, 15, 16 years later, right? So I think institutionally, there are a lot of things that we can do, whether it's you know, for those of us who are part of larger research universities, one of the things that I do, I send a weekly email to my colleagues, kind of giving them updates. There is always a section within that weekly email for resources on diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's an anti-racism syllabus that the university has put together. We add things from the law school's events to that syllabus, but I include that and I send it to all of 
our my colleagues every week. The other thing that I think institutionally is really important to do in addition to things like you're doing, Kathy, at UVA, which is actually having a committee put together that really looks at how do we think about these issues and support our faculty across the curriculum? Because I think it's not a, you know, we shouldn't just be talking about issues of race or issues of gender, issues of disability only in classes that are, you know, critical legal studies classes, right, or disability rights classes. Um, we, we have to be talking about this in business law classes. We have to be talking about them, whether they're intro business law classes or advanced ones, because our students are clamoring for it and because this is the reality of the work environment they're gonna go into. So the other thing that I do institutionally a lot is um, I think it's hard to mandate a lot of these things for faculty kind of across the board, but I think uh, a lot of nudging works. So I go to a lot of events where I am learning, where I am, Kind of becoming informed. And then I kind of constantly send email updates to little groups of faculty saying, I just went to this great event. So there was a series of really great events on uh, anti-racism in corporations and in corporate law that happened this past fall. There are videos, there are readings. And I sent that straight over to my colleagues who teach the different kinds of uh, business law classes. And so that kind of allows them at least the space to know that I think it might be important, um, but also to give them resources so that they don't have to go out and sort of create the resources all on their own. That's one of the sort of, in some ways, the upsides of this Zoom environment we've all been in this past year. There's a lot that we can do um, in order to support each other across law schools. Doesn't have to be created from scratch at every single one of these law schools, or else we're gonna be back to, you know, the, the, you know, looking at Cheryl's articles again from 15, 20 years ago and thinking, why are we still talking about the same thing instead of doing it? Um, so I guess with you know, one of the questions, there's some questions that have come in, which is, and, uh, which is really about students' reactions to this when you bring up these issues in your classes. And Carlos, maybe we'll start with you. I can talk about student reactions in my class too, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, you know, I think because I don't make race like a very special episode of business associations about race, my students think it is as normal as talking about breach of fiduciary duty. Like it, it just flows into the class because I, I do it all the time. And, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, Kathy kind of has the same experience with, you know, looking for opportunities class by class to fold it in. It doesn't make it a subject that's uncomfortable. It makes, it gets to the point where, you know, about six weeks into the semester, if I'm not posing the question, my students are because they're used to it, which is, which is the best reaction you can get. Like it, it's expanding their mind in the way that they think. Um, so that they think that there's more on the page than just the holding and the facts, you know, there's the, the social norms and other things outside of it. So, you know, when you work it through all throughout, I don't think you get student reactions. I think you get, if you're going to get negative student reactions, it's because they feel like this is something extra. This is something that's not on the bar exam, or this is something that's not on your exam. And this is just my professor, you know, expressing their political opinions or their social opinions. This doesn't, this isn't relevant. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's all about how you approach it that defines the student response. I would agree with Carlos as well. I think students um, respond really positively. So for instance, and, and I will say like, you can also find ways such that you're not the person who's kind of talking about this all the time, right? So last semester in corporations, I had my friend Amanda Packle who directs the Rock Center for Corporate Governance um, and who's done a lot of research on board diversity um, and worked with boards on diversity issues. And I had her come into my class for like half an hour and talk about some of the work that she's doing and some of the stuff that as she's talking to boards, what boards are looking for and talking about and having like an like an objective third party who's not their professor sometimes is just like a it's a nice change for them and also they really believe it because this is a person I'm telling you is an expert on this issue on board issues and this person is telling you directors of S&P 1500 companies are actively thinking about how to add diverse people to their or diversity to their board um, and I think that is good and every like I remember specifically after that talk 
um, I had students who like reached out or stayed for office hours and were like, we're so glad we got to talk about this issue. Like I really thought business law wouldn't, you know, I didn't think I would be interested in business law, but it turns out there are lots of issues here that are interesting to me that I'm interested in working on. Somebody asked kind of related to this, you know, are there specific areas of, let's say, like a corporations class where you can bring up these issues. So, and I think, you know, I've been talking about this in corporations for a really long time. It, a, a, kind of an easy foray into bringing it in is when you start to talk about boards, even bringing in the data about who is on boards, right? The fact that you have, if you look at the boards of you know, the Russell 3000 companies and you look at the issue that you know, there are less than 2% of those board members are black women or Latino women. And why is it that it's that way? And you could have that conversation or then you can have the conversation again when you're dealing with issues of shareholder proposals. So going all the way back to you know the anti-apartheid shareholder proposals to more recent shareholder proposals. There are many places within the class kind of as you go on where you can bring it in and have different forays into the conversation for students. And I think it gets students, Kathy, kind of to your point and Carlos's point, like it gets them knowledgeable about this in many, many different areas of business law, but it also gets them a lot more engaged because this is the reality of what they're going to practice in and what they're going to do. And these conversations are being had in boardrooms and in C-suites and you know, amongst general counsels and in law firms as well. Um, related to this, I, I see another question come in um, uh, who says, I'm also interested in how colleagues react to these pedagogical issues. And maybe I'll send this to Afra as a person who sees most faculty. This person also says, please don't identify me. Don't worry, we can't, we don't know who you are. It says anonymous. <laughs> we'll keep it anonymous. I mean, I think, you know, my sense has been that colleagues react really positively to these pedagogical issues and talking about this in the classroom. But I'm also in a in a particularly unusual law school faculty, right? I'm on a faculty that is a majority minority faculty. I'm on a faculty where we have these discussions kind of really regularly. Um, I think my sense is that colleagues are really appreciative of getting the information and getting the support that they need for their classes. And that's one of the things that I'm seeing kind of generally across the board. I know that, you know, there are some people who are afraid, right, of bringing this into this classroom and starting the discussion in this classroom. But I also think one thing that I try to get across to my colleagues in sort of informal conversations is also, you can't just put the onus on those of us who are minority law professors or women law professors to only be the ones bringing this into the class. Like it has to be every single person who is teaching contracts or who's teaching corporate law that brings, it, that brings these issues in because they're so relevant to what our students are gonna do. And it can't just be that only certain groups of people are expected to bear the burden of bringing this into the classroom. So um, Kathy, you know, and Carlos and Liz, this is really for all three of you, which is, we said, you know, part of what we were also going to discuss in this session is how to support uh, junior scholars, the next generation of scholars as they're entering into the business law, you know, the, the scholarly field and the teaching field. How do we do that? What support did you find particularly helpful? Um, I know a lot of people have been asking in the chat for kind of links to the articles that we've been mentioning and to the resources that we've been mentioning. Um, but you know, what have you found helpful and what do you hope to do in terms of the mentoring that you all are doing? Well, I would say, you know, what what we need to, to help the next generation is uh, professors who wanna teach this way are more inclusive in, tenor, in, in materials so that the burden is not on someone like me who's junior to design their own curricula in addition to doing all the other service on campus. Um, you know, I personally, like I'm writing my own casebook for BA because I, I haven't found one. You know, all the questions in the chat, like which cases, which this, which that, it's like my casebook will be out in the fall. There, you know, <laughs> and we incorporate inclusivity throughout the entire casebook. Um, you know, the other thing I think that would be helpful and that I have found helpful is when I am on a faculty that is more diverse, right? So if, you know, if the faculty is more reflective of reality, it makes it a lot easier 
to have these discussions in faculty meetings amongst your colleagues, it makes it easier to think about incorpor incorporating these positions because you're seeing the positions every day. Um, you know, the other thing I think that we really should be doing more as professors is, is to do more mentoring and do the mentoring that it takes to create the pipeline. And so, you know, if you're on a campus and you don't have students who are marginalized for marginalized groups on your law review or going into judicial clerkships or doing the things that it takes for students who might be interested in these issues to then become professors who are interested in those issues, you have to think about where, where is the problem in, on your campus? Like where is the problem in your campus culture that you do not see marginalized students performing according to their admissions metrics? And you know, what do we have to do to make it so that these people want to spend their careers addressing these issues? We have to create the pipeline. Um, I, th I think the other thing that, is, that would be most beneficial to the pipeline as well is not to expect your marginalized faculty members to be the ones to educate you on these issues. Um, you know, to, to do the homework on your own or hire someone to do it. You know, um, educating your colleagues is uncompensated labor. Um, and if most of the people of color on your faculty are junior, they're there to write, they're there to get promoted, they're there to, to work on their teaching, um, they're there to do their assigned service, but they're not there to be uncompensated consultants every time you have a question about race. Um, so, you know, think about the fact that educating other professors is work that is worthy of compensation and not exploitation. And so if self-study can't get you there, it, it, you don't look to the black person <laughs> or the other person of color to get educated about it. And so I, you know, I think the most helpful thing people can do um, to help scholars who are trying to incorporate these things into their curricula or who are trying to, you know, promote and expand faculties is to value their time and value that they are scholars too and need to be doing their work, not just educating you in a way that is completely uncompensated. Yeah, I, th I think if, if I could jump in here now too as the junior, as the juniors person here, um, I think that uh, I, I agree with everything that Carlos just said, but also like feel like that is aspirational um, and know that then the reality is that a lot of times what ends up happening is that people feel, still feel uncomfortable like taking a lot of this on themselves. And so the, the labor still ends up landing anyway and is going to end up landing anyway on faculty of color, junior faculty of color, especially of, you know, designing all of, all of this curriculum, uh, giving all of these talks. You know, I, you know, I'm, I've, I'm so new to this, to being a legal academic and I'm already just like, inundated with invitations to do all kinds of talks and stuff all on, on stuff like this and you know get all of these emails about oh you know you know how should I teach tell me how to do this like that which is it's great but also it's labor um a lot of labor and I need you know and I need to publish in order to, to get tenure just like everybody else um and so I think it's going to take uh, support from the rest of the faculty to really recognize all of this labor that a lot of, especially the junior faculty of color that are getting hired right now at a lot of institutions across the country are doing um, and trying to think creatively about both how to support them, but also how to recognize that labor and make sure that they're able to juggle all of these things that are landing on them. Um, and keep up with all the other expectations on them um, because it is hard. And as um, uh, a lot of the, the work that I think uh, people are generally uh, excited sometimes that, that we can do with institutions and with diversifying institutions and building and you know, being a part of, of um, building communities and reforming communities, et cetera, and curriculum, uh, like those are all good things too, um, but how does that fit and how do we value it and how do we see it and recognize it in comparison to everything else? Um, because if at the end of the day, it is 
lesser, then that's, that's a problem. But also, you know, I'm thinking about those years of my career, my early career, and do I want to spend them, you know, writing a textbook or writing like, you know, what I think of as my brilliant article, <laughs> you know, innovative article ideas. And, you know, that's also a question of service too. Uh, that's very real. And so uh, just the mindfulness about all of that, I think is incredibly important for your colleagues. I'd like to follow up a little bit because um, I think it's important to say that uncompensated labor is slave labor and slave labor is never good, right? And so it is not aspirational to be expected to work for free at all, right? Like that is not okay, right? Google is free, I am not. <laughs> so, you know, if there are ways that deans and other administrators can figure out how to compensate us, we can have course release leases. You can physically write POC checks, right? If you don't have the ability to figure out how to hire someone and do it, and you're gonna look to the lowest compensated, least powerful person on your faculty to do it, that's a form of abuse. And I think we have to stop consenting to being abused, right? We have to stop, like every invitation is not great, um, especially if I'm the only one getting the invitations, right? So I deserve to have a summer just like my white colleagues. I deserve to get to focus on my scholarship just like my white colleagues. And if, if there's an institutional failure, the institution needs to fix it, not me, right? The institution was here before me, it'll be here after me. And we have to stop you know, taking on that burden and being martyrs as people of color. I think just to, you know, to also talk about this sort of institution as in the, the institution where you're at, you are at, but also the institution of legal academia kind of more generally, and even having these conversations and thinking about this. So who are you inviting to conferences? Whose work are you reading? Whose work are you commenting on? There are a lot of amazing junior scholars of uh, you know, minority junior scholars, junior scholars of color. Carlise has all this great scholarship out there. Kathy has great scholarship. If you're thinking about how do I incorporate some of this into my classrooms, one of the things that you can do is read their work, assign their work, um, get their work known, and not just because they are a, you know, they're right about a particular you know, area or you want to have more diversity on your panel, but because our work is important and because our work is valuable. And so I think that is one of the ways that we can kind of think about this too, is sort of a larger academy is to really think about who are you inviting to things? Whose work are you reading? Whose work are you promoting? Whose work are you citing? Are you including more junior scholars in your events? Or, you know, did you put together the fancy corporate law event that you put together without including these other voices? And are you including the same voices over and over and over again, right? The same way that people do for boards, right? Um, Kathy, do you wanna to add to that as well? Yeah, I think these are all really great points. I would echo Carlos's point that like, I, there was a point, there was a time in my career when I was asked to be on so many committees. And I, I, I remember I like compared myself to a similarly situated white male colleague. And I was like, he's on two committees and you asked me to be on eight committees. Why, why, why is this? And I remember the person I was talking to at the point at the time said, well, it's because we need more diversity on these committees. And I was like, yes, that makes sense. I guess that's right. And then I remember reaching out to a mentor, like a senior woman of color. And she was like, well, that doesn't seem like a you problem. If they need more diversity, then they ought to get more diversity. Does that sound right? And I was like, you know, like I, it's been so ingrained, right? But I do think that, you know, I think it's helpful to think about um, the parts of diversity that you do care about. Um, so for instance, like I care very much about um, having more faculty of color. So um, at UVA, I'm on the academic placement committee. So we put on sessions for students who are interested in teaching and we do individual reach outs to students like Balsa and Apalsa. Um, and that's not actually my idea. It's actually the idea of my committee chair who is not a person of color. Um, I also try to individually reach out to students. So since I joined last fall, I probably had a dozen conversations with students who want to ask a question about the class, but then like 20 
20 minutes or maybe like an hour later, they reveal that maybe if they weren't a lawyer, they would like to be a teacher like everyone else in their family. Or maybe they actually came to law school to be a professor, but they kind of lost the thread along the way or they got two Bs and like they didn't really think that they could do it. And I always tell them that like, you know, like we tend to think of ourselves this way. Um, like when I was in law school, there were these dudes who we all thought were gonna be professors. Um, and they were all like, you know, like editor in chief of the law review and whatever. And the people who actually became professors in my class, like were none of those people. Um, and overwhelmingly they were women and people of color actually, which is actually pretty interesting. And just thinking about like why it is that I internalized the fact that I couldn't, like I wasn't gonna be a law professor. Like I think I had zero professors of color in my 1L year. I think I had one woman teach one quarter of my 1L <laughs> year. Um, but then when I reached out back to my professors in academia, it wasn't like who I expected, like, you know, like I didn't specifically reach out to professors of color because I didn't have any, um, but I reached out to Tom Ginsburg who said like, I remember you were so smart and motivated and you wanted to write papers and of course you could make it. And that was such an inflection point for me, even as a grown up, to think like, oh wait, this super smart person believes in me. Um, and then I think he actually punted me to Tony Casey, which kind of, there was a question that came in the chat where someone um, said, you know, how, how do you deal with the tension um, between students wanting mentorship and access to faculty of color? And I would say that mentorship comes in all forms, that a student might reach out to me because they relate to me um, initially. And then I feel perfectly comfortable, like, like connecting them with someone else who's maybe closer to their subject area, who can then mentor them. And in fact, many of our colleagues, I think, do want to mentor students of color and help kind of build that pipeline. They just either, they don't know how or students aren't approaching them. Um, and I think that, you know, part of, I think of myself as like a, like a conduit, like a broker, right? Like I, I see students who want to write about such and such and I just connect them to that person. And I think my colleagues do a good job of mentoring them. I think in terms of the, the students and the outreach to different faculty as well, especially in business law where we bring in so many adjunct faculty to teach in our classes and sort of providing different types of mentors to our students. I think this is another place where institutions could be doing quite a lot of work so that the work isn't just falling on the faculty who also have scholarship and other kinds of service requirements in terms of uh, teaching. You know, we have huge numbers of adjuncts at all of our law schools. And so one of the questions I think for the, the institution is really to go back and say, okay, if we're bringing in six, seven, you know, uh, six, seven practitioners or judges into teaching advanced bankruptcy or fintech class or blockchain and the law, you know, all of these other kinds of classes, who are we bringing in? Um, are they, you know, are, are we bringing in the same exact people? Are they we bringing the same people that we brought in 25 years ago? Are we bringing in a crop that, uh, that includes women and people of color? Are we actually then sort of doing the hard work of attracting those types of adjunct faculty into the classroom because they're gonna have a different perspective and they're gonna be able to mentor our students in a different way. So one of the things that I've spent a lot of time on as an associate dean is really trying to cultivate a new crop of, of adjunct faculty for advanced classes, whether it's in business law or in other areas. That's a lot of work institutionally uh, to do. And that shouldn't be on the part of just you know, the faculty members you know, in the field themselves, but it really should be something that sort of the Dean's office is committed to. Okay. Um, maybe a little bit more you know, about sort of how do you, Kathy, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how do you um, specifically, what do you do specifically to mentor your students that wanna go into academia and want to then think about these issues in the classes that they're teaching? Yeah, so I have um, my former colleague at Utah, Jeff Schwartz, calls it a very hands-on approach to mentorship. I think that might just mean, or detail-oriented, I think might be what he says. He can stick up for himself in the chat. Um, but I think I uh, kind of like a helicopter mentor. So I'll literally say things like, you know, I really, like I feel very strongly about like, that there are many things that you're afraid to ask, right? If you're a first gen or if you're a person of color or woman or come from a different income level. Um, and what I would say is like, I'll say things like, send me your, like after you do interviews, send me your, you know, after you go talk to a judge, send, send me an update and tell me how it went. 
or like send me um, send me your thank you notes if you want me to read your thank you notes. Um, and like it literally takes me one one second, right? Because they're just like thank you for interviewing me. And now at UVA, I'm very lucky in that we have an awesome career services office that really takes care of all of that. But I do still think that we still have some students who are like fearful of it. Um, or I will find students who. Um, will tell me things like you have to really listen carefully for what they're saying to you right that if they have a lot of questions about like the theoretical part of what you're talking about or they ask you like is there a paper i could read about this like i think what they're trying to do is feel out the waters to see if you're somebody who might ask them like oh are you interested in teaching can i can i talk to you about teaching like this might not be a next year thing but maybe in 5 years will you come back and talk to me if you're interested in teaching as a career so that's kind of how i do it um i also like read so many drafts <laughs> um it's bonkers um but i literally like i'll i'll commit to a certain number of drafts of student work that i'll read for like their notes competition or whatever like every week and I just like, I'll set a timer and like set a timer for how long I'll read each draft, which is how I kind of keep my um, sanity and read a lot of them. Um, but I think that for a lot of people, they, um, they're, you know, like I especially noticed this with, so I went to a small liberal arts school where like the whole selling point was like that professors would read all your work really carefully and give you lots of feedback. But I think it's a privilege to be able to go to a tiny liberal arts school where you get that kind of attention. Um, I think that a lot of our students went to larger schools where they may not have had somebody read their writing line by line, um, especially like academic writing rather than like IRAC. Um, so I think if you can do that even for like an abstract or an intro. I actually, if you want me to be honest, is uh, I kind of, uh, I, I model my mentorship formula on what I call the Afro Afshari Poor formula. So when I was a fellow, um, like a first year fellow, Afro was like, send me your work. And then she would like send it back with all these markups. Like she was my senior associate and I loved it and it was great. And so I just try to do that. That's very nice. Carlos, you have so much um, practice experience before coming into academia. And I would go, you know, I'm kind of curious about what kind of mentorship you got that was helpful, what was less helpful, what you wish you would have gotten and also how maybe some of that supported or didn't support you in terms of thinking about these issues in your teaching? You know, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, I don't know if it's me or if it's, if it's, uh, you know, other black women in general, but it's harder for me um, to find mentors who do not look like me at all. Right. Like, so I do have people who have been helpful along the way, uh, but I would not be in academia, but for, Black women at South Texas, um, and and you know not knowing them at all, but meeting them at like downtown group and other Black women's groups in Houston, and then and then coming into it that way, um, I really didn't get any mentoring from my law school. And even in the process of going on the market, I didn't bother calling them at all. I didn't make any connections with law professors. I did not have a single Black woman as a law professor um, all throughout law school, and I only had one woman all of law school, um, and so. You know, if I'm in a classroom and everyone is a 60 year old white man, I just am not connecting. Um, and so I, I didn't, you know, get mentoring from there, but I was able to make up for it with, you know, people I met outside of the law school. Um, and, you know, so one thing I tell students, um, like I talk to a lot of students who are not at my law school. Um, either they reach out to me on Twitter or they are proactive and they will send me an email and say, there are no black women faculty at on my campus, can you help me? Um, and so I wish I'd been more like that. Uh, but I think, you know, if you're a student and you are somewhere where no one looks like you, um, I would say most of us will respond to you, right? I, I don't know anyone who will not respond to a student email, even from a student who, who is not um, at their institution. Um, I would say too, um, one thing we can do in, in, in our mentoring um, and in thinking about how we diversify our profession um, is to acknowledge that, you know, there's bias in who we think of as the guy who's going to go be a law professor. And, and some of that is a class bias. And maybe we need to be, you know, acknowledging that, you know, I practiced a long time because I had student loans. I didn't necessarily want to practice that long. I would have loved to come to academia five years sooner, but Sally May had a different opinion, right? So, if it is financial, right, and it is class-based, 
Uh, that means if we only are looking to people who fit our mold of what a law professor looks like, which is, you know, some clerkships and some fellowships and, you know, maybe never working big law and getting deep, deep into the theory, instead of getting into the, the, the weeds of practice, we are automatically ensuring that this profession never diversifies. Should we take some questions from the audience? We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so uh, let's start at the top. So let's see, oh, it's, it's slightly obscured. Okay, so every, one question says, all of your approaches are really unique and customized. What was your thought process in deciding and choosing what issues to discuss? Um, there seems to be so many ways this topic could be approached. So maybe I'll ask Afra. So how, how did you decide of the many topics, how to, what to put in there? I spent a lot of time talking to senior people in the field, not just in at my law school, but sort of different law schools. And usually before I did that, I went and read their work. So, you know, there, you know even when I came into academia in I guess, 2007, there were a lot of amazing scholars who were already writing about issues of race and business law or on the issues of gender and business and corporate law, right? Feminism and corporate law or intersectional issues in, in, in these uh, areas. And so I spent time reading their work before I went and then kind of picked their brains in sort of different ways of, okay, these are all the different ways that I can bring this into the classroom. What am I able to do? Um, you know, how much am I able to do? And this is what I learned from your scholarship in being able to do that. So I think sort of, um, thinking through that because that also gave me ideas about things that I could assign in a classroom uh, that was really helpful in terms of thinking through this. And I, you know, this is something I'm, as I said, I think I started out today saying this is still a work in progress. This is something I, I still struggle with. So I'm working through teaching a mergers and acquisitions class and you know, thinking through, okay, well, even to the basics of like, whose case book am I assigning? And what's highlighted in these cases, I'm so excited to hear about the, the case book that Carlos is putting together, because I think it's really important to kind of assess and reassess, learn and continue to learn on all of these issues. I will also say there's a request in the chat, Carlos, for a table of contents to your case book if you have something available. Uh, um, I will try to find it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll, <laughs> if I'll find it while talking, um, but I will find it. And if not, I can send it to the folks at Chicago and maybe they can route it or I'll put it on the web somewhere. Maybe yes. that's easier. And I would highly recommend Carlos's uh, children's book. <laughs> yes. I would say that. Which is available on Amazon. <laughs> um, Elizabeth, how are you kind of thinking through this um, as you're sort of gearing up? Yeah, so well, actually, so quickly on the sort of picking materials um, and deciding how to approach them and integrate them. So one of the things that uh, I have initially struggled with when trying to think about how to bring in uh, tribal court materials um, is sort of when do, like which ones are the best ones and like how to teach it and, and, and when to get it right. And uh, I think that that's the wrong way to think about it um, because, uh, and I think it's tied to the way that it feels like all of the other cases that we teach have, are just so frozen and old <laughs> and we can sort of like, oh, I'll just nail it. And then I'll, I'll, I'll have my way of teaching the one famous case and then it's perfect and I'm done. Um, but that's, the, you know, the, the canon's just the canon because it became the canon and, and there's no reason it needs to stay that way. Um, so I've realized that really what needs to happen is sort of a comfort with discomfort and sort of trying out this case and seeing if I can sub it in for this other case that um, you know I use for the same concept. It's just that it comes from a tribal court. Seeing how that feels. Um, is that something that then uh, you know gives me an opportunity to you know talk about this tribal court system and you know maybe they're a slightly different approach or does it sub in you know completely how does that go? You know if, if it doesn't go well like okay you know try, try something else. Um, it's okay to uh, fail and adapt or to then say, okay, now I'm going to instead take an approach of, of bringing in um, something that's really different um, and putting it in as a, like a slightly more discreet teaching point, teaching moment uh, that's going to involve more of a pause to discuss uh, this point in this different legal system. Um, and so it's, there isn't sort of like this one answer of the silver bullet that's been figured out 
that will work for me and for you and how I teach and you teach, I think it's a comfort with just being able to try and to uh, fail or not fail, but you know, like have it something not work and then try again and then figure out something that does work so that you can engage with these topics and this material in a way that feels good for you, that feels like you are teaching it, that um, the students are learning and responding and uh, that is you know, better than just not even bothering. I totally I, I, agree with that. Oh, go ahead, I would say, yeah, I would say too. start with what you know. So, you know, a lot of my scholarship focuses on personhood. So it's really easy for me to think about issues of identity. And it's easier for me to read up on, you know, the racial aspects of what my other scholarship is on, rather than looking at all of business law and trying to find something. So if you're someone who writes about governance, you know, go read about, um, you know, diversifying boards and like it start with what you know, um, and kind of learn all the aspects of, of inclusion and equality with your specialty and then branch out from there. Um, and, and it changes every year, right? You know, and I would say, you know, when I fold race into my classes, um, it is very influenced by what I am researching outside of class and, and how issues of identity fit into those, you know, and that scholarship as well. Um, so start with what you know, right? Don't, don't just jump off into the deep end um, and maybe even you know, I, I would say maybe not everyone else's materials work for you. Like, you know, maybe you do find that one Law Review article um, that addresses issues of equality in your primary wheelhouse, and that's what you do this year. And then next year, you know, you branch out a little bit more. Yeah, I, I would say that I agree with that. My one kind of tip for myself really is that um, I like kind of actively try to, I guess, like reprogram the way I think about business law. So I kind of, um, it's like such a nerdy thing to say, but like, I literally will just be like, did I get to talk about any of these perspectives this week? What about, if I haven't this week, what about next week? Or I'll think about who I'd like to have in my classroom as guest speakers. And I'll think, oh, well, Bob would be good. And then I think to myself, well, what about Jane? Like Jane would be also very good. Like Jane is also a partner. Like sh her name isn't floated as often because she's Jane. Um, um, so I just try to kind of incorporate um, those things. One thing I would actually just have to put in another plug for is Jessica Erickson's excellent resource, which I put into the chat. So I would just take a look at the list of items and see what excites you. Um, so for instance, I found that students have really connected really well with some of Mirsa Bharadaran's work on um, the inequalities in banking. Um, and I have a student from Utah who just thought like, she actually actively thinks that she's a rock star and will tweet as such, which I think is kind of fun. Um, and then I would also say that my colleague, Andrew Hayashi has a new paper out about um, taxation, like property taxes, which we'll be talking about, what he'll be talking about on the 19th in our other panel. Um, which is also really great. Um, other questions, Afra, go ahead. The other thing I would say is look at the new scholarship that's coming out on this and think about how to incorporate that in your class. So Veronica Root Martinez and Gina Gale Fletcher have this great new piece coming out. It's already posted on SSRN, right, on equality metrics that really talks about institutional investors and how we can think about disclosure on issues related to race. It's a great piece. Can you think about, okay, is this, is this a, a way where we can talk about these issues in a business law class? Look at all, it's all based on current events. It's all based on important conversations that are being had. Can Continue to stay updated on what this, you know, what the new scholarship is, because work like theirs can really enrich actually the experience of your students in your classroom. But that involves reading beyond the people that you typically always read. Okay. Yeah, we have one other question, um, and we do have maybe room for a couple more. So please send them. Um, so one question is, how can a sixty-year-old white man be more responsive? How can they? Be, how can? How can this? This person would like to know how we can be more. Uh, how can they can be more produ proactive? So I maybe think, I'll turn it over. Yeah, go ahead, Carlos. I'll start. I mean, I think um, you have to think about culture and and norms some, and recognize that. Um, you know, doing what you've always done isn't going to help you reach those students. So maybe you need to reach out to marginalized students, right? If, if, you're, if your activities are flag football and, you know, you know other, other very gendered racialized things, uh, then you're just not going to get those students 
reaching out to you. Um, you know, think about what you do. You know, so many of us do things to try to get to know our students better and, and think about whether you are doing an activity um, that, that makes some people uncomfortable. And I think we're sensitive to the idea of not doing everything around alcohol. And so maybe we are, you know, we think about, you know, other activities in that way, but, you know, some of the, the socializing that we do with students um, is, is not just going to make students of color feel uncomfortable. It might make a student who has children feel uncomfortable and, and things like that. So, you know, just consider that not everyone starts from where you start from and that what you think is fun or interesting or like a good activity is not, you know, everyone's idea of the same thing. Like maybe it's something that makes them uncomfortable and so they're not gonna come talk to you. Um, you know, I had one professor in law school, actually it was Ernie Young, who is now at Duke, but he was at, at UT when I was there. And Ernie Young made all of us go to lunch with him in group and small groups of four. And we said make, cause it was like, Jesus Christ, I have to go have lunch with my fed courts professor and he's my hardest professor. Uh, but because it was this small group setting and like, you know, he's eating a sandwich and we're eating a sandwich and we're all just hanging out. And because it's not a group of 20, um, it was very easy to bond with him and get to know him in that context when I might not have if he'd had a cocktail party. I think that makes a ton of sense. I would also just say like, think about the students with, to whom you usually say something like, you're doing really great in class. Like what, have you thought about a clerkship? Have you, um, you know, have you thought about this? And I was just talking about this with one, one of my colleagues yesterday is that we reach out, we like our clerkship office is fabulous and reaches out to like, you know, the vast majority of our students every year about clerkships, but our students of color tend to, well, have a stronger tendency to be like, well, no, I really need to like go and start making money right away. Um, and we need to be able to counsel them because, you know, their dad is not a law firm partner. So we need to be able to counsel them on like, why you would make the kind of financial sacrifice. Like, what does the clerkship bonus look like? Like, I have lots of students who tell me like, I'd be interested in being a law professor. How much money do you make? <laughs> and like, it helps, like, like, you know, it helps them to kind of, you know, we need to have these like real kind of like personal finance conversations with our students that might be barriers. And I think this is more of a class barrier really than a race barrier um, with our students. Um, yeah, other questions? We've, we've managed to clear the questions from the queue. Uh, if I can add to that, I think another element of responsiveness can also just happen in the classroom um, because I think it's very easy, especially with the, you know, the Socratic method and the way that we teach to um, hold on to control of the room uh, very intensely um, and to have a hard time uh, letting go or sort of humbling ourselves when maybe we're not the expert in something and uh, the, the context of the discussion is pivoting such that it's possible that one of the students might actually have some unique experience or expertise, whether it's from their work experience or maybe they're just socioeconomic background, which sometimes can mean they, they have something uh, to add to the conversation um, that means you know, we need to sort of cede some of that uh, power for a second and like, you know, elevate their voice. And I think that that's a different thing than uh, just, you know, being quiet. I think, you know, being mindful of what it means to actually, you know, center that room around the student and wanting to hear what they have to say if they are, if they want to if they um, can really uh, make it make a huge difference um, in the dynamic of the room and, and how students' voices feel when they are trying to bring up things like that, um, if, if that's playing out. And one way, I mean, you could do that in a way that's, you know, somewhat feels safer sometimes for some students so that they don't feel on the spot. I mean, we, I, I did something this, this year, which is, um, Lisa Fairfax came and gave a fantastic talk on board diversity based on our, um, as part of our racial justice speaker series. And so one of the requirements for all of my mergers and acquisition students was that they had to go attend it because it's critical conversations as part of m &A. And then I asked them to actually write reflection papers. So short kind of 250, 300 word reflection pieces based on what they got out of that talk, how it 
related to their experience, what else they wanted to know. And that then allowed me to sort of highlight their voices, ask some of them, would you be willing to talk in class, right, to figure out what are the issues that they're really interested in, in a way that felt safer for them so that I didn't have to put them on the spot without really having, have a con having had a conversation with them beforehand. So I thought we, I would ask each of you one question and I, we didn't actually pre-plan this. So I'm just gonna put you on the spot. I wonder if we could suggest like kind of one specific case or article or something that you use to accompany what, would we, what we would think of as like a traditional law school curriculum. And for Liz, um, I wonder if you could kind of give us like a little bit of information about like specifically like how we might find tribal law resources to incorporate, like kind of a concrete suggestion. So maybe I'll, I'll start and then I'll turn it to APRA. So one thing I added this year was that um, I teach an agency case um, about, it's called uh, Miller versus McDonald's and it's about finding a Sapphire in a Big Mac. Um, and it's a franchise case about like, um, you know, how much support does McDonald's corporate give to franchisees? And one thing that I talked to my students about was that at the same time, there was this complaint by former black franchisees of McDonald's alleging that they were treated differently, that McDonald's corporate treated them differently. And so I added the complaint to Canvas and I talked about the complaint in class and I kind of just talked about it the way I would talk about anything else in class. Like I'd be like, there's a couple extra small, like things I want to tell you about this case. Here's one thing that's happening kind of currently. Here's how it plugs into the bigger discussion. And in that way, I kind of like fold the discussion, like introduce the, it's very early in the class. So I introduce the relevance of race to class pretty early. And I just kind of sprinkle it in that way. So Afra, turning it over to you. So I did uh, this this year with mergers and acquisitions. Now I've done it a, a few times, which is, you know, we spend some time at the beginning talking about who are the decision makers and sort of the important decision makers, whether it's you know the investors, whether it's the board, whether it's the C-suite. And so I actually spent quite a bit of time on the data on who's actually in those positions, who is not, who's excluded from those positions uh, kind of really regularly. And then I tie it to you know, literature from finance and literature from social psychology about decision making and kind of bringing all that in. Then I talk about the law firms and who are the partners at the firms and what are the sort of the recent data on that? Why is it that you know, black women are not partners in fields like M&A, right? Why is it that they're systematically like excluded from those positions um, or not mentored for those positions. So I think there's, you know, to me, that was like a, in some ways, like an easy introduction at the very beginning of the semester when we're talking about the decision makers to bring them in. But there are other places too. You could talk about Me Too covenants, right? <laughs> Later on when you're going through the contract, you're reading cases like Revlon and you think about the history of Revlon as a business and who were sort of the objects of its business and who actually were the, the power players and decision makers in that case um, and who gets excluded generally in sort of the, all of the cases that we teach as sort of the fundamental cases in M&A. There are all these places that you can bring it in um, in that kind of a class. Uh, Carlos, do you want to talk you know, about one thing, one or two things that you do? Um, one thing I did this year, um, and it's an easy, accessible resource, I incorporated 1619 Project into my UCC class, um, which then led me to go pull old Virginia statutes and show students and to pull, um, like I went to the, li to the Library of Congress, which has indexed all this stuff online, and I pulled um, some of Robert E. Lee's promissory notes where he um, he leased out his enslaved persons to help fund the war or pulled some of Thomas Jefferson's promissory notes and, and things like that. So, um, you know, 1619 Project, everyone can just Google it. Um, and it has a whole section about race and business and, and slavery and business that is easy to fold in. And I, I, I like it because it's written in layperson's terms. Um, and, and so it, it's very easy to reach all of your students without needing to get into the nuts and bolts of like what is critical race theory when you're folding it into the class. And then Liz, let's hear from you. Yeah, so I'm sending a link to everyone now of the Tribal Court Clearinghouse, which inherited um, versus Law's database of a bunch of different Tribal Court opinions. Um, there are a lot there, but it's by no means complete. Um, I have an article coming out in Stanford Law Review in the next few months 
um, where I get into detail about how frustrated I am about the status quo of lacking complete access to tribal court opinions um, throughout the country. But between that link I sent and some of the stuff on Lexis, there is still a lot um, for you to run searches um, and find a lot of things out there. So um, I have done lots of basic searches for basic legal topics to like pull um, cases that could work well for teaching on various different topics. And I'm hoping to actually develop a blog um, where I can also compile um, cases that have worked well for professors in the past based on different topics um, of, you know, subject by subject, like property, contracts, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, for each course. Um, here's the some tribal court cases. But another thing, especially with people teaching corporations, I really can't say enough that uh, teaching the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act and um, all that that means for Alaska Native tribes and Alaska Native corporations, I think just really essential. It's a huge part of um, America's sort of history with the sort of idea of the corporate form and, and questions of equality. So I, I really think that, that should be on syllabi, full stop. Um, we have fi one final question. Oh, did, was that already answered? Mm -hmm. oh, no, it was there. Um, what does anyone have any kind of thoughts about, you know, con concerns about, or what, how do you react if students react negatively about it? And this specific question is coming from an untenured female, uh, you know, woman of color. How do we, how do we deal with that? Maybe I'll ask Afro first. So I, I responded for a second in the chat to that question, but for me, for example, for writing the reflection papers, they actually, they start out with a certain number of assignment points and you're, everyone is required to do the assignment in order to get the assignment points. You're not going to get graded on that assignment, but you have to do it. And so I don't find that, you know, and because I do a kind of a variety of assignments in class and I tell them part of the reason we do this is because you're going to have to think about these issues and talk about them aloud once you're a general counsel or once you're a lawyer at a firm. Um, these are going to be issues that your clients are going to be dealing with and so I want you to be able to at least write it and think about how you would answer it so um, you know I think having you don't have to have all 100% of their grades like based on a final exam right there are different kinds of assignments that we can give to our students that sort of help them reflect on these particular issues as far as student reactions I think um, you know as a woman of color if you don't mention race people assume you're being racialized anyway so i think that if you are if you if you're concerned about negative feedback um you know maybe the first year i taught uh, you know at first class i taught was pr and i didn't get into racial issues at all because it was my first semester teaching and in teaching evaluations you know students are like well she thinks this because she's black or she thinks that or you know she was trying to force race down our throat and i was like i didn't even mention it you just looked at me and made the assumption. Um, so just know that you probably aren't risking anything by just going ahead and addressing it. Students might see it where you don't intend for it to be if you don't just go ahead and address it. Um, so, so in some ways we kind of don't have a choice, <laughs> which is why I started to you know, just try to find ways where a discussion of race fit in and to get away from the canon because you know, people read, students read my beliefs into the canon whether I mentioned it or not. So yeah, I think we're at time. So I just want to take a minute and thank all of our panelists um, for joining us. Thanks to Carlos, um, Liz, and Afra, and all of our awesome event staff at both UVA and Chicago for working on this. Thank you also to everyone who participated. It was wonderful to see your names light up in the participants panel and to see so many friendly icons of initials, I guess. I would say faces, but that's not who you were. Um, and I invite you all to join our workshop. We have another one of uh, these about uh, scholarship at the intersection of race and business law and finance, which might be might bring up stuff that's good to include in your classes. That'll feature work by Abby Atkinson, Marissa Baradaran, Andrew Hayashi, and Anil Kavali. So uh, same time in two weeks, and I hope you'll join us. Thank you so much.